Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. I just want to give it a couple of minutes before we formally start because we are waiting for you guys to arrive. Um, so at the moment, we have about 100 people on, just so you're aware, Amanda. And um, we will make a start shortly. I just wait for a few of you to come through. Um, just a couple of tech things before we do formally start today's uh, webinar. Um, you are all going to be on listen-only mode and on mute. If you do have any questions, then just pop them in the question um, chat function on your screen for the GoToWebinar um, panel, and I will be able to respond to those. Um, similarly, if you have any questions for Amanda during her um, webinar, then do pop them in there as well, and I'll be able to feed them back to Amanda. Um, please note as well that we will send out a recording of the webinar along with the slides um, in the next couple of days. And the last 15 minutes of this webinar will be a Q&A section. So yeah, if you have any thoughts or anything throughout, then please do pop them in. Um, so Amanda, we have about 150 people um, that have joined us already. So good morning to everybody. And um, I think we'll make a start. So. Um, hi everybody, um, my name is Alice McDavid and I'm the Head of UK Training at DOS Training. Um, today's free to attend webinar is on persuading and influencing skills. One of our associates, Amanda Tu, who will introduce herself more formally in a moment, will be delivering this webinar for us and Amanda has delivered persuading and influencing for DOS Training for Oh, a few years now. So it's really great to get all of her thoughts and um, everything um, that we can share with you guys. Um, ultimately, what you will see and listen to in this webinar is kind of a snapshot and a taster of what Amanda would be able to deliver um, in within a day or in a couple of days program. Um, Amanda and I were actually talking before um, we started this broadcast about um, the importance of leadership and management and how persuading and influencing and communicating comes into that. So if anybody is looking at or interested in doing any leadership and management programs, then this is kind of an aspect um, of an area that can be covered within that. So if you've got any questions or like to know more about what else we can deliver following this, then please do get in touch. My contact details will be made available um, at the end and we will obviously be sending out all of the information today so just respond to the email or you can find my information on the DOS training website and um, for those that have just joined once again my name is Alice and um, yeah Amanda I'm gonna hand over to you now so enjoy and um, those people that have just joined any questions just pop them in the chat and I will answer them when we can so yeah thanks very much thanks Amanda Thanks, Alice. Uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, present this 101 webinar on persuasion and influencing skills. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself in a moment, but first I'd like to begin with a reflection. Um, this is a reflection for you, not for me. So I'd like you to um, take a moment or two to think about what it was that made you sign up for this particular webinar. What was it that attracted you to the webinar? Why did you sign up? And if you pop that into chat, um, Alice will field what you're putting in and read a few out. So take a moment or two to reflect. What was it? Just one or two words, not a whole sentence. What was it that made you sign up to this particular webinar? It's not about objectives. It's about what attracted you to this one. And so, Amanda, we've got a couple of things coming through now. Um, Cheryl says um, the meaning gets lost in translation. Chloe says to be bolder. Um, Ram says variation. Um, Kaylee says to help encourage change. Um, she, Nicole said she thought it'd be interesting for her role. Susie, an interesting topic. Lucy, curiosity. Um, Louise, always good to be thinking about maximizing my skills in this area and like the snappy title. Um, Bob said free and useful. Um, Sue, to better influence my new manager. Oh, we have so many things coming through. 
Um. <laughs> that, that's great, Alice. That gives me that gives me a sense. You can keep yeah. on putting them in if you're still writing them, but don't worry, Alice isn't going to read them all out. Um, but if you want some accountability and you want to pop them into chat, then you can do. I'm going to come back to that later. I'm not going to pick up on any of it at the moment. I'm going to just leave that with you and we'll come back uh, to what um, attracted you to the seminar later on, a uh, seminar, webinar. Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about myself. And you probably read in the publicity material, there was a, a bio, and the first thing you probably read was that I was an actress and a drama coach. And if you didn't read it, you know it now. Um, I tell you this for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that I want to just dampen down any expectations that you might have that you're going to get some kind of polished, rehearsed, Oscar-winning performance because you're not. Um, you probably know that most actors are actually not that comfortable doing public uh, speaking. We're used to hiding behind characters. So, um, yes, expectations, lower them straight away. But the reason I mention it is that I trained in the method discipline and the method approach is an approach that instead of literally acting, you find the character and you find the role, you find the motive inside you, everything, no matter who you're playing, what you're playing, you find the resource in yourself so that you are authentic and you are genuine you were present, and that helps people to engage with you at a very, very genuine level. And that's essential when it comes to influencing. So that was the first thing that I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to say about acting was that most actors, and you probably know this, spend 99% of their time, unless they're lucky, doing other jobs. And when I first started acting, I was still quite young. In fact, I think it says in my bio, I've got about 25 years of experience in this area and I worked it out and it's close to 40, which is a little bit worrying, but it is. So I don't know how I underestimated it. I must have been feeling uh, uh, different on that particular day. So I spent my first few years doing many different jobs, most of which were in sales and promotion. I sold advertising space. I did cold calling for people selling pensions and life insurance. And believe you me, that was difficult. I did in-store promotion and demonstrations, selling people things they didn't even know they wanted when they went into the store. And I even sold, sorry about this, timeshare. I sold timeshare for a Portuguese timeshare company, but I sold it from Leicester Square in London. And during all of this time, I loved it. I loved the work. I believed I was doing good. I believed that I was selling things people wanted because I don't think I could have done it if I had thought differently. And then one day a manager said to me in one of the jobs, we need you to train someone else up. We need you to share your skills. We need you to share your approach, what you do, your methodology. And I was stumped. I had no idea what they meant. I was just being me. I was just engaging with people. I was listening to them. I was curious. I love the fact that someone said curious or curiosity earlier, so important. I realized that when I was engaging with people, I was genuinely focused on them. And I learned very quickly that people wanted solutions. They wanted something that was gonna add value, that was going to be beneficial to them. And I could always find that in whatever product or item or service it was that I was selling, but at a very genuine level. So that's really where I first began learning how to influence and persuade and learning that from, from a very genuine place. That was career number one. Career number two, I retrained. And for the last 30 years, I've worked as a criminologist. So I've worked across criminal justice, homelessness, substance misuse, um, I've worked across the statutory sector, the voluntary sector, and most of the time my position has been in partnership. So working in contracting, commissioning, um, and doing a lot of negotiation. And naturally, a big part of that is influencing and persuading. 
So again, I was using those skills. But now I was becoming more conscious because it was a different sector. I was becoming more conscious of what I was doing, how I was doing it. And I became, yes, more aware of the tool I was using to ensure that I used the right tool at the right time with the right person. Then career number three came along. In 2008, I decided to bite the bullet and become self-employed. I decided I wanted to dedicate myself to doing the work I was passionate about and not do any other work. And I have been so blessed since 2008 to be in a position to be able to do that. So I am today a, a progressive coach. I work with all kinds of people internationally, pandemic aside. I'm a consultant, a trainer and a facilitator and I'm an associate with Dodds. Today, I spend most of my time helping people to fulfill their full potential, leaders, managers, frontline staff, volunteers, and at the heart of everything I'm doing is helping people to find in them the resources they need. And no matter what you do, whether you are managing a team, whether you uh, write policy, strategy, whether you're in change management, influencing and persuading, will be absolutely core to whatever you do. So today what I'm going to do is share with you five common myths that I believe trip people up. And I'm going to share with you my three top tips, which are my three secrets. So persuasion and influencing skills. It's really interesting because people often attribute a negative connotation to persuading and a positive connotation to influencing. But in fact, they're both neutral words, neither of them negative nor positive. They have different meanings. They're different tools. Uh, and in a, a longer training session, what we would do is explore what each of them were and when you would use them, because it's about consciously knowing how and when to use them. There are styles, there are formulas. And naturally, um, there are also approaches and frameworks. Influencing and persuading are essential leadership skills. I don't think you'll ever come across an effective leader that isn't effective at influencing. That's getting buy-in, bringing people with them. Because one of the first things they have to do is they have to sell a vision. And if they can't sell a vision, if they can't demonstrate uh, a passion for that vision, if they can't show excitement, if they can't make people interested, then it's unlikely that they're going to be effective as leaders. It's also a key management skill. And when I say it, I'm talking about both persuading and influencing here. When it comes to managing people, we have to motivate. We have to help change behavior. We have to engage with people who may be disengaged. We have to sell concepts we might not be happy with ourselves, but we have to find a way to do that genuinely, a strategy, a policy, a way of working. And to be quite honest, influencing and persuading are so essential just to life in general, whether it's trying to get an appointment or whether it's trying to get people to, to come around to an idea that you've got or a proposal you want to make. These skills are essential in everyday life. But I have to say, you're probably using them naturally anyway, because for some people, they just do come naturally. We are passionate about something and we can sell it because when you're passionate, you do. For some people, it's not quite as natural. And for them, maybe there are areas that they need to strengthen and build. However, for all of us, these are skills and tools that we can continue to build. And we need to use reflective practice in order for us to learn from experience because we become excellent by reflecting on our own experience and learning from it. So what's the purpose? What are we trying to achieve? So we've got this tool bag as leaders and managers, and we've got a host of tools in there that we're going to use consciously. And what about this tool? When would we use it? What's this tool for? Whether you're making a proposal, whether you're trying to get buy into a policy or strategy, 
whether you want to influence one person, a group of people, the general public, whether you want to motivate, whether you just want to bring people around to your idea or get the team working better together. The truth is that you're going to make a proposal or a presentation or you're going to share an idea and all you want to do is to achieve a yes. Because the purpose of persuading and influencing is to achieve a yes. When we look at the core skills, I can put them in a nutshell for you. It's about relationships, communication and behaviour. It's about you. It's not about being something else. It's about drawing on everything you have, building on those areas that maybe aren't as strong as they could be, but knowing what your strengths are too. So let's have a look at those myths. Five common myths that trip people up. So the first myth that I'd like to look at is that persuasion involves manipulation and coercion. Uh, I was saying to Alice at the beginning, actually, that people really do attribute, and I said it at the beginning of the webinar, they attribute something negative to the word persuasion. Uh, whenever I'm doing training, they'll always say, yes, well, it's about manipulation, it's about coercion. But it's not. Persuasion is a specific tool. If you need to get people to comply to something, if perhaps there's a crisis, uh, if you hold all the knowledge and information, if there are, are time restrictions, if there's high risk, you're going to want to use persuasion. They can all be used negatively. You can influence negatively. Look at the world today, you can see many people that use influencing in a negative way. So it's not about the word um, or influencing being negative or positive. It is quite simply about the intention behind it. If your intention is to add value, if your intention is positive to bring about benefit, then you will use either tool in a positive way. So. Myth number two, that influencing is something that you do to or on a person. People often say to me, yes, well, I just want the tools. I want to know what to use to influence people. But actually, influencing is something that you do with people. It's collaborative. Remember, it's about relationships, as I said earlier. It's about trust, fundamentally. It's about working with someone. It's about drawing out from them. So influencing is not something we do to or on, it's something we do with. And at its very best, it is an invisible conversation. Obviously, we need to prepare the ground and we, we need to know what we're doing. We need to plan and prepare. But the sacred space of influencing, and that's not religious or spiritual, that occurs between you and the other person or the, the public, and the sacred space is where you and they come together and mix, and that's where the real influencing goes on. So myth number three, influencing is a rational process. So I hear this all the time. People want data, facts, information. We need to make our argument. We need to convince people. In fact, if you make your argument and you try and convince, you're more likely to get conflict. But actually, influencing is about hearts and minds. It's also political. Political with a small p, but also sometimes with a big p. Political with regard to people's reputation, uh, their job, their position. Um, so there's a lot of it which is political, particularly uh, when we're thinking about influencing and persuading within the statutory sectors. But at its very core, influencing will always be about the rational and the emotional. And whenever I'm training, I would look at working with you around emotional intelligence as well. People buy solutions and people buy 
people. It is about relationships. It's also about ego and risk and what's in it for me. So you need to be appealing to the person. Of course you need the data. Of course you need the information. You need to be able to back up whatever it is you're saying. But at the same time, you need to appeal to the individual at an emotional level. So myth number four, people who are effective at influencing prepare their strategy based on their desired outcome. Well, that is true to some degree. Of course, you've got to base your purpose and your influencing strategy on your desired outcome. You need to know what you want to achieve. But the key is the other person or people or group. Really effective managers, leaders who know how to influence, focus on the other person. That's about finding out what's important to them. You need to be able to sell to them what's in it for them. You need to also mitigate any risks they ha might have, any concerns they might have, and you want to be able to put that into your dialogue. So you're answering potential questions that might come up and you won't know what those are unless you do your research. So part of the framework of influencing is doing your research and finding out about the other person or people or the public, what they might need. But the most important thing is finding out when you're with that person, truly engaging with them, asking great questions, listening to them, They'll give you all the clues. They'll give you what's important. And then it's about being flexible and framing your message to meet their needs. Because influencing is really about the other person. Myth number five. Effective influencing requires a good poker face. That means we mustn't show too much emotion, surprise, shock. I'm afraid this is the worst myth of all. If people buy you, if it's about relationships and behavior and communication, it must be genuine. It must come from an authentic place. Authenticity is the key. From a place of authenticity, you can be flexible. From a place of authenticity, you can create trust. You don't have to like each other. You can have opposing views, but you need to be real. You need, need to be engaged. The key is to be congruent. Who you are inside is the way you're behaving. Then you need to be consistent. And you also need to have a certain level of confidence in the uh, premise that you're putting across, the idea you're putting across, trying to get the buy-in, the team, whatever it might be, you obviously need to have confidence to be able to do that. So having a poker face, I'm afraid, is a terrible myth. Um, the most important tool you have is you. You have all the resources you need. You may need to develop things, and I suspect that we all do. But the key is the starting point, what are you already good at? What are you already strong at? And building on that. So they're the five myths that most often, in my experience, trip people up. So let's move on to my tips, the three secrets. So I call these the three P's in the pod because they, well, yes, I'm sure you guessed it, they all begin with P. It's very strange doing this webinar. I hope that you're all still there. Um, I can't see you and I can't hear you and I can't feel you, but um, I'm hoping that you are still there and my signal hasn't gone down. So let's move to the secrets. My three secrets, you've got some images, some icons there that might be giving you some clues. So let's have a look. Don't tell anyone about these, these are my secrets. Um, Amanda, really quickly, just so you're aware, I've got people saying that they are here. Pete says hello. 
oh, everyone thank with you. you. We've got um, 190 people on, so yeah. It's all That's good. Great. Thanks, Alice. I think That's it's okay. more it's more about when you can't hear, you can't see, and you can't yeah. feel. It's yeah. Thank you for that. And thanks for those that that um that chipped in and said that they were there. Glad to hear it. Okay, so if we're ready, we've got the secrets. Okay, so secret number one, preparation. Secret number two is position. Secret number three is presence. So let's go, I've noticed already an error here. I've lost my N, but there we go. So the first one I wanted to talk about is preparation. So even though I was talking about the importance of focusing on the other person, if you don't do your preparation and planning, you are going to fail. Um, it's really important, uh, and when I'm doing the training, I'll go through a very specific framework with you, so it's very easy to plan. But it's very important that you do your preparation, first of all, on your purpose. You think through, what is it I want to achieve? Um, why do I want to achieve it? Um, what's it going to look like? You need to really think that through. Then you do need to look for the evidence, the information, and the data to support you, because the, the rational part of it is important. Once you've started to, to get an idea about what you want to achieve, you then start to look at it from a different point of view, which is from the other person or people's point of view. And part of your preparation will be secret number two. And secret number two is your position. So the position that most people take, and this is where they fail, is their own position. They look at it only from their own perspective. But the key is to look at it from your perspective and then to look at it from their frame of reference. So that means genuinely suspending any judgments and seeing it from their point of view. How might things look? What might they need? What might they know? Remember that people buy solutions, not problems. So what problem are you solving? What benefits are you giving them? The important thing is when looking at it from their position is you'll probably have to do some research. If you've only got two minutes because you've been asked to do a presentation straight away, or if you've got two weeks, use whatever time you've got effectively. Do whatever preparation you can to find out as much as you can about the other person or people. You want to know what's important to them. Um, you also want to know um, what this might conflict with and what it might complement. So that you can draw that in because they might be concerns that people have and and remember that the key is trust and by being yourself by being authentic you will establish rapport and trust the key uh, sorry i keep saying key but the, the most important thing for me to say to you is don't wing in it. Don't wing it. Don't wing anything. People often say to me, well, if I don't know the answer to a question, I'll wing it. If someone catches you out getting one thing wrong, then it's going to undo all the good you've done. They'll start to question everything that you've said. So never wing it. If you don't know the answer to something, and this is probably going to happen to me in a, in a little bit when you ask me questions, um, it's really important to admit when you don't know. And, uh, and also to admit when you make a mistake, because that is about authenticity. So with regard to position, seeing it from their point of view uh, and then looking at what they might need um, and doing as much research as you can. And as I say, when, when we're doing a training course, I would look through a specific framework for you so it was nice and strategic. And secret number three probably won't come as any surprise at all because I've been touching on it all the way through. And that's about presence. That's about that sacred space, about being engaged with the personal people you're talking to. To be present, we need to get out of our head, and I don't mean on alcohol. We need to be in that sacred space. So to get out of your head, you need to make sure you're prepared so that you're not worried that you're not going to know something. Because when we're truly engaged, when we're truly present, what we need will arise. So engage, which will help you then to really listen 
to ask great smart questions that will elicit from the other person information that you need that will help you to reframe what you're uh, trying to sell, promote, share, change in a way that is meaningful to them. The other important thing to remember is when you're truly engaged and you're truly listening to people, they feel heard. And when people feel heard, it really helps to build rapport and trust. Five myths, three secrets. And now we're back to the reflections. What made you sign up to this particular webinar? Hmm. When I'm training on influencing and persuading, I will take you through the six, actually now seven, human laws by Robert Cialdini. And we look at the principles of influencing. Those principles include things like reciprocity. What's reciprocity? Reciprocity is simply when you get something from somebody else, a free gift, an opportunity, some help, some support, you feel much more inclined to want to do something for them. So when I was doing in-store promotions for various different products all those years ago, we would often give away a free gift or a free sample or a free opportunity. And that's what would draw people in. So I wonder how many of you did sign up to this because it was free. I know at least one person, Alice read them out, did say that. And that's okay, that's, that's what attracted you to it. For some people, the other part of the reciprocity was that you might have thought that you would have got a gift of a few quick tips, which I hope you have. And that too is okay. For some of you, the marketing material might have really spoken to you. The words might have been really, they must, might have really resonated with you as an individual. Yes, this is, this is me. This is, this is talking to me. That's another principle of influencing. We want to do things that feel personal to us, that speak to us. We're influenced when it speaks to us. Or maybe you've done Dodd's courses before and you highly respect them as an organization, and rightfully so, and that you know that their trainers are experts and have a lot of knowledge. And the truth is, that too is a principle of persuasion and influencing that we like to buy into things that we believe people like us buy into. I'm going to share with you one thing, that if you're trying to influence people, what you want to do is to ask questions that elicit the word yes. And if you go back to my publicity material, you'll notice a few yeses in there. There's a technique, and I use that term lightly because um, I don't want it to sound manipulative. But the technique is if you can get someone to say yes to two things consecutively, they are much more likely to say yes to the third thing. So if you're posing questions that, where the answer is yes, then you're elevating the opportunity for them to keep saying yes, 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 yes. So be careful of the way you pose your questions, because in fact, influencing when we look at the communication skills is really about structure. It's about language. It's about creating a story. And when you're creating a story, you want the story to be one where the person who's been influenced will walk away feeling good about it. That when they're retelling the story about how they bought their new mobile phone upgrade or their new car or a new Dodds course they, they've just signed up for, that they can tell that story in a very positive way that helps them to feel good. So it touches on their pride and their ego and their reputation. So craft a story, use your communication skills well. And think about what made you sign up to this course. Did it speak to you? Was it about the fact that it was Dodds? Was it because it was free? Whatever it was, that was a principle of influencing and persuasion. So as Alice said at the beginning, um, 
This can be part of a bigger program on leadership management, which is generally what, what I deliver. But it can also be a one day standalone and it can be a variety of different workshops honing in on different elements of it. But what we would cover on a training course would be looking at the principles, which I was just touching on. Um, we would look um, at obviously the core skills, um, the styles, the different styles, the frameworks to give you some clear tools to take away. And I would say the most important thing for you to remember is that all of us are different. And when you come on a training course or you come to a webinar like this, if you know what it is that you want to get from it, that will help you to focus on asking the right questions, focusing on the right information so that you can take away just about exactly what you need. And hopefully each of you have got something out of that. So. As scary as it might be, and it is, I'm going to open early for questions. Uh, and I say scary because, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm speaking genuinely and authentically and from the heart. And if I don't know the answer or if it eludes or escapes me, I'm going to be honest with you. So I hope we have some questions coming up because yeah. it's over it's to you. Over All, reflections and, All comments. reflections and comments. Um, yeah, hi, um, Amanda, I'm back. Yes, we do have many questions. Um, I want to start with something that Sandra has said, um, because I think maybe you can help her out here. It's not entirely a question, but um, I think it's something that maybe she struggles with. Um, so she says that she wants to persuade others, um, but she wants to find ways to do this because her belief system may be different to theirs and what persuades her may not persuade them. So I was wondering if you had any advice for Sandra. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Thanks okay. for the question, Thanks Sandra. Question, I've got some Sandra. feedback, got Alice. Some feedback. I'm not sure if that's because sure you're, you're not on mute. Not on mute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry. Okay. Back with you now, Sandra. Okay. Really good question. Um, one thing I would say is that we need to be aware of our own cognitive biases and heuristics. And I don't know if you know what I mean by that, but our cognitive biases and our heuristics are, are shortcut understandings of the way that the world um, exists and the way that things happen. And they cause our belief system to exist as it does. And all of that can be changed, but the important thing is to become aware of it. So the first thing I'd say is that by becoming aware of your own belief system and some of your own biases and some of your own heuristics which are your as I say your, your shortcuts your um, how you connect things together is the first starting point so it's about you so reflect on you and develop your awareness what am I bringing to this what am I feeling what am I thinking then it's about what am I trying to achieve here? So it's going back to that planning stage and being really clear about your purpose and then look at it from the other person's point of view, as I said. When looking at it from the other per per person's point of view, you may not know their belief system. But what you can do is do as much research as possible about that person and think about what might be important to them. Sometimes it's known as their, in business, it's known as their currency. Is their currency their reputation? Is their currency being right? Is their currency um, being, being in control? So knowing what's important to them and then trying to reframe the thing that you are selling or persuading them with in a way that you believe will resonate with their currency, with what's important to them. But the starting point is always you. So first of all, what is my belief system? What am I bringing to this? Because the belief that trips us up most often is the one that sounds ridiculous. We don't believe in what we're doing. We don't believe in what we're persuading the person to do. So for instance, sometimes I'm working with a leader or a manager who's working on a change program and they, they haven't fully bought into the change, change program themselves. 
they're trying to persuade their team that it's a good idea, but they haven't bought into it themselves. And if that's the case, your belief system will affect the way that you behave. You won't be congruent. So congruence is, as I said earlier, that who I am inside marries up with how I am being externally, so the way I'm communicating, the way I'm speaking. And if I don't fully buy into the change program, it's going to come through. People may not know, but they will feel it. So begin with you. Do you believe in what you're trying to persuade uh, uh, people into believing, into doing, into feeling, into signing up for, buying into? Then look at it from the other person's point of view and see if you can identify what their currency might be, what's important to them. Sometimes it's about them being right. And sometimes what you want to do is to propose or to frame your idea in a way that allows them to own it themselves. So you could share it with them in a way that, that links up with things that they may have said or done in the past that associates it and can lead them to believe that actually it's their idea. So know their currency. Look at your own belief system. Do you believe in what you're doing? Do you believe in yourself? I hope, I hope that answers your question, Sandra. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Um, I've got another question here from Jenny that says, what happens when you're successful in influencing someone, but they are then further influenced in a different way by another colleague? Do you leave it or do you try, the, try them again? So i.e. when somebody's very easily influenced, what are your um, recommendations there? Mm. Okay, so when I'm doing a training course, one of the things I get people to do, and I will get you to do if you go on a training course, is to identify the people that you want to influence. So you would look at an immediate um, need to influence. You would look at who you're trying to influence. And then I ask you to think about who might have their ear. Because a mistake we make is that we influence the wrong people. We assume that this is the person we need to influence, but we don't think about who has their ear. So we need to then consider who we might need to influence first or at the same time. Sometimes when we scope out who are the stakeholders related to who we're influencing, it can be really quite interesting who they are. They could be family, they could be friends, they could be managers, they could be um, people that they manage themselves. But Helping to influence the person you want to influence means knowing all the stakeholders, scoping that out and trying to find a way to influence them first. And it also often means getting your own superiors, managers um, to buy into what you're doing as well so that you can get from them maybe some, you can tap into some of their knowledge and experience about the person you're trying to influence and the stakeholders that might have their ear. So I'd, I'm not going to give you any kind of tips at this point, except to say, have a look and see who you think might have their ear. Sometimes it's hard to gauge, but who might know? Sometimes receptionists, administrators, PAs, you can have informal chats with and uh, ask good questions and you can find out maybe who they are influenced by, then it's looking, well, you're not going to ask directly that. You might ask who, who else might have an interest in this policy and where else might this policy link to? And then, of course, you need to do some more homework. So it's about prevention more than cure. It is about thinking this through beforehand. However, if it has subsequently happened, the other thing I would say is that you are going to find it difficult to bring people around because they don't like um, the idea that they've changed their mind and now you're trying to change their mind back. So you might actually need to look at a different way now of approaching it, which may be to start thinking about how you could influence the person who had their ear. 
So it is about prevention rather than cure. It is about thinking through the other stakeholders. And it is also about getting people involved. So this is a prevention bit as well. So I'm sorry, it's not about cure, but it is about prevention. There's something called the IKEA effect. And it's pretty obvious, really. The IKEA effect is that we put much more value to things that we're involved in. So the story goes that a man knocks at a door and he offers this lady uh, an IKEA table or a table that you had to put together and left it with her. And she put the table together and she used it. And a week later, he knocked on the door and he said, hello, I've got the same table, but it's ready made up. Can I swap? And she said, no. And it didn't matter that her table wasn't that well put together. It didn't matter that it was a bit wobbly. But the table she'd put together, she had invested in, she'd been involved in. So if we think there are people that have the ear of the person we want to influence, we need to get them involved somehow. Because people will buy into things that they're involved in. So that's that's where I'm going to leave it with you. No, no tips um, for how we might influence them afterwards, other than to say, to look at it maybe now from a different perspective. So having a look at it from the position of the person you influenced and why now they might have changed their mind. And that actually the other thing that comes to mind, and it's again a preventative thing, is we often leave the table without signing the deal. And that's a, a metaphor. So if you have influenced someone, ensure at the end that you decide on the next steps. Ensure at the end that there's some verbal and written agreement of what has been agreed and what you're going to do. So even if that means afterwards putting it into an email and sending them an email saying, this is what I'm going to do, this is what you're going to do. Because actually, once something's in writing, once it's been agreed, people are less likely to go back on it. Okay, so okay. back to you, Alice. That's really helpful. Thank you, Amanda. And I think this next question from um, Sue Khan might kind of link to that and what you were saying about communication and the importance of that as well. So um, Sue Khan says, hello, Amanda, do you have any good questions to get to know your new manager and their work style, please? Mm, mm. Lovely. Thank you. So I find it, I find it so intriguing that people don't realize how much other people love to talk about themselves. Being curious about somebody means asking great open questions. And I'm quite certain that, that all of you on this call today know what I mean by that, but I'm going to make no assumptions. An open question is a question that allows the person to answer in whatever way they want. And there is a specific technique that you use, which is called the five W's and the H, which is what, where, when, why, how, and who. And if you begin any question with the five W's and the H, it will be open. You can then use a, a subsequent question, but don't begin with this. And it's known as, it's an acronym, and it's known as TED. And it stands for tell me, explain, describe. So we don't use all of TED, but you could use one of them. So open questions allow people to flow, to talk, to answer however they want. The key is to be curious. When we're genuinely curious, when we are genuinely interested, we ask, we naturally ask good questions. We'll naturally ask an open question. But when we are unsure or when we're stuck in our heads or when we're not really that curious or not really that engaged, we're much more prone to ask closed questions, which are questions that end in yes or no or an alternative. So ask a good question. Be curious. Really listen. So when I say really listen, I mean listen to what they're saying. Listen to the way they're saying it. Give them time to process, to speak, to finish. So if you tend to be one of these people that speak very quickly, think very quickly, 
slow yourself down. Connect and engage with your manager. Ask them a great open question. So one of the five W's and the H. Being cautious to keep it simple. Because in my experience, what people tend to do is they, they're in their head and they don't know when to stop talking. So they ask a great open question, then they carry on talking and they do one of two things. They either close it down and end it in, as a closed question on doing all the good work, or they ask a multiple question. They kind of ask a series of questions and, and then people get confused and don't know where to answer. So ask a great open question, keep it simple, be curious, that doesn't mean be nosy. Really listen and engage and feel and sense what comes up and slow things down and then pick up on what seems to be the key of what they're saying. I've used the word key so many times today. I think it's because I saw an image of a key earlier. But listen, watch the body language, the emotions, and pick up on what you think is important and then keep being curious, not nosy, curious. Curious comes from a place of good intention. People love talking about themselves. People love being listened to. It will help to build rapport. It will help to engage you. And of course, the other thing is to try and find some common ground. Not too much, but you know, if they say, in fact, I think when Alice and I first met, um, we, we found out we were both from a, a certain part of, of London. Um, and, and it was kind of like, oh, you're from, I won't, I won't out. Alice, uh, as from where uh, as to where she's from, but it's like, oh, you're from there. Oh, I was from there, and then you start talking. Oh, hasn't it changed? And so, if you can find a way of connecting to what they're saying, that that can really connect you. But keep it genuine. Make sure it's congruent. Slow things down. And engage. And use their names. And use People them. love to hear their names. People love to hear their names. Um, thanks, Amanda. Um, I think kind of this kind of links to that seamlessly, really. So um, you talk about kind of speaking to different people and getting to know them and using common ground. But how would you deal specifically with difficult, egotistical people? So that comes from Greg. So I don't know if Greg's got somebody who works with. Um, <laughs> but are there certain techniques that you would use for people with um, like mannerisms like that? So we've all got egos and um, in work in particular and specifically those that get to senior positions, um, ego is a very big part of um, what helps them to be confident a lot of the time. It's not, it's not a good thing if I'm doing uh, confidence at work training, which I do for Dodds as well. Um, we talk about the importance of keeping your ego in check. But we all have egos and egos have a role to play. But when you're dealing with someone that has a really big inflated ego, the chances are, and I'm going to be honest with you, that sitting behind the ego is insecurity. Sitting behind the ego is the imposter syndrome. The bigger the ego, the greater the chance of insecurity and imposter syndrome. So if you can start to look at it from a, a different position, that that person is being behaving in this way because of insecurities what you will want to do then is to to help to build their confidence so to build their confidence is and this has to come out in a genuine way is to draw out things they're saying to build on things they're saying to use their language never challenge that will always create conflict if you want to disagree with them or challenge them in some way, the, the, the way to do that would be not to you to, don't use the word no, this is grammatically not very good, but don't use the word no, because no is quite triggering. So talk around the no. So if you can to agree with what they're saying, you, you may not, it may not be what you believe, but agree with what they're saying insofar as I can see your point. That's a good point I hadn't thought through. And then move on to look at some solutions by offering them. So, for instance, if, if they're challenging something that you're saying, perhaps what you might do is say, 
that's a very good point. Um, now that you raise it, I can see and understand why you might feel that way. What other ideas have you had? And going back, uh, as Alice said, to the last um, question is engaging with them where they're at, being curious, but it is building on their strengths. It's framing your ideas so that they can own them as much as possible. So for instance, if you're trying to persuade or influence a manager or a, um, a colleague that has a, a big ego that is problematic, you might want to frame what you're trying to influence in a way that allows them to take that as their idea to a team meeting, to take that as their idea to their manager. So you're offering it to them. Again, it's about finding out what's their currency, what's important to them. And the likelihood is if they've got a big ego that it is about making them feel confident. So it could very well be that you go to them and you say, I've got this idea that I'd really like to put forward at the next team meeting. And I've noticed that um, people really listen to you. And I wondered whether you might uh, support me in putting this forward. In fact, maybe you, if you have a look and if you feel that it's something that you could um, you know, put your, put your name to, perhaps you would like to take it forward to the team uh, instead of me. So build on what they do well, try to find out what their currency is, make them feel confident, try not to challenge them, to criticize them, um, but all of this needs to play, come from a genuine, authentic place. Um, thanks, Amanda. I'm very conscious of time, but I just wanted to ask one more question that people seem to be um, flooding the chat with. Um, obviously, in the last year, things have changed dr drastically and dramatically. <laughs> um, and the way that we're persuading and influencing and communicating with people is very different to how it once was. So I was wondering if you could maybe give us a two minute explanation of how we can now do this online better. And also, just so everyone knows, this is something that we are able to deliver in um, like a one day course as well, if you're more interested in how to persuade and influence online and like in this new normal, as everyone keeps saying, that I'm sure we're very fed up of, but it is the way of the world. Um, so yeah, if you could kind of give us your thoughts and reflections on that, that'd be really helpful, Amanda, to end with. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad you raised that, Alice, because um, first of all, I've been, as, as we all have, um, I had a very quick learning curve and had to move everything online uh, just over a year ago. And as a progressive coach, I, I never did any coaching online because I believed that I had to do it in person. I had to feel the people. I mean, I don't mean physically. I had to feel them emotionally. I had to be in the same space as them to be able to coach. And I've been coaching more over the last year than I've ever done. And it has been to some degree more effective. So I know that I'm talking about coaching here, but the reason that I think it's been more effective is that people have been in their own surroundings. There's been a level of vulnerability that I don't get when I'm in person with them to, to, to the degree that I've had it remotely. So the reason I mention that is let's see the benefits in in what we're working with at the moment, not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Everything I do at the moment is online, but I have to um, change a lot of what I do because you can only see a small part of me now and my face is huge. So what I would say to you is it's really, I mean, my face isn't huge. It's huge to you over the webinar. Um, it's really important that we are comfortable using uh, video conferencing. Uh, whether we're a participant or whether we're in a meeting or whether we are leading something, that we, we feel comfortable, that we're at home with the technology, but also that we feel comfortable in our presentation skills. And there's lots of training that you can do out there to support that as well. And to remember that they can only see a small part of you. So you need to use, be really aware of your face and your facial expressions because they show up really you know, uh, they're exaggerated. You need to slow things down. And um, when you're trying to persuade an influence, actually, that is the key. You need to slow things right down. Simplify, slow it down, 
and use your ABC, which is make sure that your message is accurate, brief, and clear. So keep it simple. That would be what I'd say. And, and become familiar, become confident, and just engage. But do remember that your face will be magnified. I hope that helps. Hope that helps. No, that's really helpful. Thank you so much, Amanda. And all of the feedback that we're getting is um, fantastic. So, yeah, I wanted to say a quick thank you to everybody for joining us this morning. Um, as Amanda has said, this can be delivered as a one day course or um, or more, depending on what sort of program you're after. And also, if this is something that you just looked at for an hour, we will be sending out the, um, the recording. So please do share it amongst colleagues if you just think that this snapshot is going to benefit them as well. Then that's what we're here to do. We're here to help you. Um, and if anybody has any questions, then please do get in contact. But um, we are two minutes past, so we're going to leave it there. But um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining. And um, oh yeah, everyone's saying now, Amanda, thank you. Hazel says thank you. Jill says thank you. Victoria says great session. Um, so yeah, I think we um, thanks, we did the job there. So thanks a lot, everybody, and thank um, you. we thank will you. be in touch. Um, thank you and speak soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.